Hello. I'm going to start with a question. Um, and this is the question. What has been the most important policy in reducing carbon emissions over the last 10 years? I mean, there have been plenty. So uh, I'll narrow it down to four, the top four. And in the uh, top slot is uh, renewable energy, particularly wind and solar. This is spreading throughout the world. It's getting more efficient every day. It's not efficient as number three, which is uh, hydropower, which has always been important but continues to be key. And those two fell into insignificance when you compare it to number two, which is industrial gas emissions. We're seeing fewer, particularly of the exotic, most potent warming gases being thrown into the atmosphere. But actually, the number one slot is bigger than all those three combined, and it might be surprising to you. It's protecting rainforest. Now, it will surprise you because we don't often hear good news about it. Um, but it's what I want to talk about today, in particular, how we make sure over the next 10 years it remains just as important in our fight against climate change. You will have seen, I expect, a rainforest talk before. So I'm going to get the extraordinary amphibian picture out of the way early on. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do biology, but I will start with a bit of geography. Now, this is South America. We're zooming in. We're going to a small village on the western edge of the Amazon called Kutuvreni. And uh, Kuti sits on the western edge of the arc of deforestation of the Amazon. So uh, this is basically where, to the west, you see degraded ex-forest, and to the east, you see the pristine habitat of uh, the little fellow earlier would enjoy. And the reason I wanted to tell you about Kuti Vereni is because it's emblematic of so many indigenous communities in the tropics. Ten years ago, Kuti was 300 kilometers from any chain source. Then it was 30 kilometers, and then five years ago, a gang of loggers walked into the village and offered them $10,000 for their 40 cedar trees. Now, this was a tempting offer. The community was suffering from malaria, it had very high levels of malnutrition, and even though $250 a tree for something that's probably worth 50 times that at least, uh, didn't seem like a good deal, even though they could see from the communities to the west that loggers weren't the people you wanted to deal with because uh, it wouldn't end with the best trees. They would try and lend you money, put you into a position of debt bondage. Even though they knew, they knew all those things, it was still very tempting because if you have a sick child and they need to get to hospital, that's eight hours by boat away. How do you pay for the fuel? If you have, as I say, four out of five children suffering from malnutrition, it's very difficult to think how you're going to find the cash for that emergency bag of rice. And so while it's easy to paint the loggers as a terrifying, destructive force, the real driver to de deforestation here is poverty. We could get rid of the logging gang very easily, but their barriers to entry are so low, there'll be 20 more queuing up behind them. The real issue instead is finding an alternative for a community that's been dependent on the rainforest for absolutely everything for generations for a community that in return has been the best possible custodian of that rainforest, right up until the point when poverty and the pressures of change means the last asset they have to sell is that forest. This sort of piecemeal destruction, let's call it degradation, is now the biggest threat facing the rainforest. And that's partly because of the good news that I mentioned earlier. So one form of deforestation is actually in decline the clear-cutting, industrial deforestation that you'll be familiar with from so many terrific Greenpeace campaigns, that is actually now starting to slow. We're not out of the woods yet, but it is on the way out, because it's a commodity play, and this is important. The reason that it was so easy to clear-cut so much forest is because we didn't care where our soya or our palm or our beef came from. We didn't care so long as it was cheap. And therefore, demand was there. When demand starts to falter, because we have terrific campaigns, or because the Brazilian rail goes through the roof, or because, and this is the real key one, because the United States marks making, starts making their own ethanol, then you will actually start to see rates of deforestation start to fall. As I say, it's not over yet. But we now know how, from the top down, to control this awful trade. 
That does leave us with a problem, though. Namely, what are we going to do about the 260,000 acres we still lose every day? The irony, of course, is that these are not acres lost every day. These are individual trees. But, and this is the shocking thing, if you add it all up, degradation is actually destroying more rainforest than any clear-cutting or any industrial reforestation, deforestation today. What it's actually doing is twice as much forest. Some studies think it's even four times as much. So it really is the priority. Now, you would probably think that if we can sort out soya, if we can sort out palm, or at least get towards that, we can do something about this trade. Surely there must be 101 regulations to stop the illegal timber trade. Surely, um, if you think about it, roundwood timber is conspicuous enough that there must be a way to prevent this. The funny thing is, though, this is such a high-value trade the illegal loggers will always find a way of circumventing those regulations. Let me tell you the most popular way of doing it at the moment. Let's say you have a legal logging concession. You're allowed to take wood out from there, but you've used up all the mahoganies and the cedars. So what you do is you go to somewhere like Kuta Vrieni, you offer $250 for a cedar tree, chop it down, ship it back to your concession, 100 miles away normally, and then you forge the paperwork and send it on its way. It's, it's basically money laundering, but for logs. What's really interesting, though, is that sometimes they don't just take the tree, they take the trunk, they dig the thing up, they shift that 100 miles, they dig a hole, pop it in there, pat it down, and claim that this tree has always been there, so of course it must be legitimate. Now, that sounds like a lot of work, I think you'll agree. I mean, this is 100% humidity, this is 100 miles. And it is laborious stuff, but it's no more laborious than planting, for example, 400 coca bushes in small patches around the rainforest, so when the marines fly over, they don't actually see what's going on, and then picking the leaves off those coca bushes, putting them in a ditch that's lined with a tarpaulin, adding sulfuric acid, and maybe some caustic soda and some battery acid, mixing it all up and forming the paste into blocks, and then shipping that 100 miles to where you'll then form it, re uh, crystallize it into something like cocaine hydrochloride. This sounds like a bit of a tangent. I promise you it's not. There's so many similarities between the cocaine trade and the illegal logging trade. Not least, it's the same people and often the same places who are running it. It's also immensely profitable. And if you look at the value that you can get from taking cocaine from rainforest to retail, it's pretty much the same markup as you're going to get from doing the same with mahogany. It's also, though, and this is the key thing, a trade that we've been very bad at stamping out. And in fact, the hopeless success that governments have had stamping out cocaine from the retail end is exactly why the only way we can do anything about illegal logging and the huge amounts of forest degradation it causes is by doing it from the ground up. And let me explain why. It's not like soya. It's not like palm. It doesn't respond to the commodity controls from the top down. This is a trade that, likely or not, is negotiated tree by tree on a muddy path somewhere in the rainforest. It's informal, it's dispersed, it's, I suppose you would argue, local. And this is the key thing. And the local element of this trade is where the solution lies and what lies behind the cool earth model. Because at the end of the day, Often as not, a tree will be sold off to realize short-term cash for medicine, for fuel, for food. And Cool Earth has come up with a way of offering an alternative to that. Anyway, back to Kuti Vereni. Um, when the loggers came in five years ago, the man that they were actually making that offer to is Cesar Bustamante. You couldn't come across a more impressive individual. Cesar is the chief of Kutivreni, and he's a member of the Ashaninka Nation, which is Peru's largest indigenous group. Through a huge stroke of luck, Cesar was able to call on the advice of someone else. This is Dilwyn Jenkins. Now, Dilwyn, we tragically lost him last year, but he, quite simply, is the most ballsy and effective anthropologist Peru will ever see. He's been working with Ashaninka for 30 years, and as soon as he got this call, which was within hours of the loggers turning up, 
he said, you should probably talk to Cool Earth. They might be able to help. And we could, and I've got to say, not with anything particularly clever. What we did is we sat down and said, how about we cobble together $8,000. We'll give you half now, half in a year's time, as long as you don't give in to the loggers and you keep the tree standing. Could we ask also two other things? The first is, could you form an association so we have something rather than somebody to give the money to that has a committee that rotates? It's not because we care at all what you do with the cash, we just want everyone to have a say. And the second thing we asked, and this was a real stroke of luck, if it all goes well, in a year's time, could you have a meeting with your neighbours and just tell them what's been going on? Simple as that. It was agreed, and things went well. So money was spent on um, mosquito nets to address the malaria issue. Uh, they put some money aside to have an emergency evacuation fund. Um, and most importantly of all, they invested in a cacao solar dryer, which sounds terrific. Um, it's actually less impressive when you see it, but it's a very important bit of kit, because what this is, while it looks like a, uh, a shed without walls and a plastic roof, it enables you to get your cacao beans to just the right level of moisture content, which means they don't have mould, they don't uh, spoil, and you can get a much, much higher price for them. And true to his war word, uh, Caesar also organised a meeting, except he had a much better idea. We're not going to have a meeting, we're going to have a Chitonka tournament. Now, Chitonka is a cross between volleyball and badminton, OK? We will all be playing it very soon. <laughs> and uh, Cesar um, put together the guest list, and it was 14 teams uh, from eight different villages. And it was a great success. And lo and behold, at the start of the next year, we didn't have, just have Kutivreni as a partner, we had nine other villages. And then the next year, more Chitonka, a pig raffle, which is what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> more rainforest saved. And it's worked out very well, it seems. So let's have a quick look at um, the impact on the communities. Well, the key thing, and I cannot understate, un underestimate how important this is, incomes have risen by 70%, simply because of more solar cacao dryers and the like, and better access to markets. Think what that does when you have a logger coming into your village offering. You're in a far better um, position to say no. And what about the forest? Well, Cool Earth only operates where, as you'd expect, the forest is under imminent risk, where within the next 18 months or so, we think it's going to be destroyed. And where we're operating with uh, the Ashen Inca in Peru over the last five years, the canopy loss has been 29%. In the communities that were good enough to partner with Cool Earth, less than 1%, which is a wonderful statistic to boast about. But what's really exciting is because thanks to all that Chitonka, these are neighbours, they're contiguous communities of rainforest. And the result, when you put that number into acres, it's 150,000 acres that's in community control, but it's actually well over 1.5 million acres that is shielded by that community forest. It's having a far bigger impact than we ever thought it would be the case. So that's great, but the best bit, and this really is the best bit, is how little Cool Earth does. We make small grants, we do small investments, we provide a helping hand, but all the decisions are made on the ground by local people. And this means that we don't have just to work in three projects now in Peru, or indeed in Ecuador, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or Papua New Guinea, where, incidentally, the sports day is the most exciting canoe race you will ever see. <laughs> we can work pretty much anywhere. So we're now well on our way to having over a million acres in the hands of indigenous communities. And thanks to the tournaments, that's shielding well over 10 million acres. This means Cool Earth, and I'll admit we're a small outfit, are protecting more forest through this type of community partnership than any NGO, than any government even. And what's more, we can carry on growing. Thanks to those tournaments, we're going to be doubling our size in 18 months. Now, one of our favourite supporters doesn't just think that we're saving the rainforest, he's actually very kindly said that we're probably saving the world. And of course we would agree. So if there's one thing that I'm going to leave you with, it's this. Next time you think about saving the rainforest, I really do hope you're going to do it very soon, forget about the tree frogs. Put your support instead 
behind local people, like those families in Kutifriani, because they'll always get the most out of keeping the rainforest safe. But boy, will we all benefit. Thank you very much.